You want to go find Daddy and see what he's doing? He's right there. Nice. I'm in here. Getting rocked in and stuff. I understand that. I can't see through here. So, what you doing? Man, I'm really digging this little house on the prairie, Trash. <laughs> So in this trailer, we have one Mangalitsa mama and, and one, one cut male feeder. One cut male feeder. Oh, and where are they going? VW Family Farm. VW Family Farm. And you're bringing home? One old spot mama, mama. and one old spot feeder. I'm not sure if it's a male or if it's a female. What do you see in there? Oh. Little piggy. Pig. This little piggy. It's went. got a poodle pig. <laughs> yeah, one is smaller than the other. One's grown up and one's not. So what we'll be able to say today is this little piggy went to VW Family Farm and this little piggy came home. Oh, lovely. I'm definitely liking the way my determinate tomatoes look. Very nice. It is about time to introduce some support to them. So we hosted a butchering workshop with Han Hewn Farms in February. It was when all the snow came through. We ended up getting snowed in to our house with like 12 extra people for three days. Thankfully we raised food so we can handle something like that without planning and still feed everybody. Now we knew when we decided to start raising mangalitsas, which is the curly haired breed of pig that we raise, that they take longer to grow out. Bear, get out of the way, baby. Come on, get out of the way. And that they're lard pigs, so they have like a higher um, fat layer. And of course that varies greatly depending on how you feed them. So in that class, what we were namely learning was charcuterie and using like all of the animal because when you raise your animals, you really understand the cost of it. You really understand what goes into it and, and you don't take it lightly. And so for us, we really wanted to be able to use absolutely everything. And that's really what the guys at Han Hewn focus on. Well, one of the things that we learned in doing that, in processing our first mangalitsa, was that mangalitsas are fantastic for charcuterie because the way that their fat is, uh, the way that their meat is, they are just great for that. But they don't have as much meat for things like pork chops and bacon and the things like that that you might want to raise hogs to have. Now we had raised a couple of old spots which we got through the Vincent, somebody that they know, and uh, had them processed last March which we were still just finishing up using that meat. And what we decided during that class of incense, our friends VW Family Farm attended, and we made a deal with them where we actually traded two mangalitsas, a, a breeder and a feeder, for two of their old spots, which they raise heritage breed old spot, which is great for those things like ham and pork chops and all of that. And so our goal is to be able to keep mangalitsas uh, for the purpose of charcuterie and curing and all of that, but also keep a heritage breed that is more like utilitarian for just higher level of actual just food production. One of the things that I really loved in that workshop was talking with Doug, which is one of the guys from Han Hewn, and we had this really great conversation about how I, I raise food not just to survive, yes, you get the skills that if there were ever a case that you needed like survivalism skills, you know, you would have them. But I raise food to thrive. I raise food because I wanna enjoy it. I wanna experience things I can't just go to the store and buy. I wanna, I wanna enjoy the, the pleasure that food can bring, especially whenever it's managed in a healthy way. And so that is why we want to raise one breed specifically for charcuterie, as well as one breed specifically for like just putting the food on the table. All right, I wanna show you guys something here. I actually have been waiting to see one of these to talk about it. And interestingly, I got a message about this this morning. All right, so these are my determinate tomatoes. And I wanna show y'all this blossom right here. Y'all see this flower? See how it's all fused together? Let's see. If you look at the stem, my guess is that this is probably two or three flowers that are fused together. It's kind of hard to tell. It's definitely two, it might be three. Now for comparison, Actually, that one's fused too. That one's, that's two fused together. Um, but there's like a regular one. That's just 
a normal one flower blossom. All right, so this right here, this, yeah, that's definitely three. Okay, this is called a faciated blossom. And all that is, it's just a fused, it's a fused blossom that produces the tomato. And in years past, when I've done like garden tours and tomato videos, I have always pointed out faciated blossoms. And I have told you that I pull those off. And this year I'm not going to, I'm gonna tell you why. Um, a faciated blossom is going to produce, if it's like here, you've got three flowers conjoined, it's gonna produce a tomato that is essentially three tomatoes conjoined. It's really common in heirloom varieties, uh, and that's where if you've ever seen like those big, funky heirloom tomatoes that looks like it might be two or three tomatoes that's grown together, uh, it is, it's, it's exactly what it is, because it came from a faciated blossom. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, people who grow like for competitions and stuff, and they're just trying to grow like the biggest tomato, uh, that is encouraged, that's something that you want. A lot of times people will grow a variety that they know produces a lot of faciated blossoms, and it is, like some varieties you'll find produce a lot more. Usually it's in the first flush of blossoms that you get more of those. You'll get a few more throughout the year, but usually right at the beginning when your plants really first start setting all of the blossoms at the very start, that's when you're gonna see the most of those. And the tomatoes that they produce are completely edible. They are neat, but a lot of times what will happen when you get those really funky uh, tomatoes, all of that, uh, all the folds and all the little pockets and creases in there, it's called cat facing is the, the word that's used for that. A lot of times you will get rot spots in those. It's just that they'll ripen at different degrees because they are genetically, it's a, f a few different tomatoes, but they're all growing as one. And so sometimes you'll see like one half of the tomato will start to get ripe before the other half. And so what happens is by the time the, the later half is ripe, the first half has started to kind of get soft or too squishy. And my personal preference has always been to just go ahead and pull those off and let the tomato plant put its energy into producing more regular usable tomatoes where there's not gonna be any issues. Occasionally, I'll see like a really funky fused blossom and be like, nah, I'm kinda curious here and I'll leave it. This year, I'm not planning on pulling any of those. So, we're moving at the very beginning of August. Uh, my friend Jill's taking over our farm here in Arkansas. By August, tomato season's gonna be pretty well wrapping up. Uh, it just gets really hot here and so tomatoes stop producing as much. And so, I thought, you know, why not? Let's just let the plants do their thing. I'm letting all the volunteers grow if I can this year and kind of letting the garden get a little wild for me to enjoy the last few months that I'm here. And then Jill, of course, will have a full garden with, it'll still be producing a lot at the beginning of August. And by then I will have picked all of these funky tomatoes and I'm just curious to see what they do. Are you done being a stinker, little bear? Come on. Jeremiah was trying to pull that trailer out and it's so muddy. We've had over seven inches of rain this week and bear kept running out so I hollered at him to come back in and he was sulking because I don't usually holler at him. <laughs> Good morning chickens. I'd like you to note that there is an empty nest box but that clucking that was going on when I walked up was because one of the hens is yelling at the other hen for being in her favorite nest box. It's not that she doesn't have a nest box to lay in. Sometimes they will literally get on top of each other and like vie for the most popular nest box chicken drama. Does anybody else just like sit around their animals and write scripts for what's going on with them? Because I totally do that. I'll sit there and be like, Betty, you better get up out of my nest box. <laughs> oh, hey, Mr. Con. Hey, hey, big old boy. So my elephant garlic was the garlic that I planted earliest. I want to say I put that in about November and if you'll look here I left this one on to show you guys. This is called a scape and this is actually the flower stalk for this garlic and all of these had started to try to sprout so they were all producing scapes and as you can see Benjamin and I came out here the other day and we pulled them all off. <laughs> Did you think I left you? Were you zooming by because you thought you got left? <laughs> so a garlic scape like this and of course with this elephant garlic these are larger than um, the scapes for regular like a regular hardneck garlic um, elephant garlic's not even technically 
garlic it's just an allium but actual garlic does this too and for actual garlics a lot of times they're skinnier than this and they kind of curl up and garlic scapes are really really yummy it's primarily I think it's just hard neck varieties that produces these I may be wrong on that though uh, not all varieties do whenever a plant is trying to flower obviously it's not going to put its energy into producing a bulb and for a garlic you're growing it for the bulb so you want all the energy to go down into that and usually when they start to put off their scapes you know you're getting fairly close to harvesting because uh, they're not going to get bigger for very much longer after that but these are really good and you can just uh, use them you can make fried garlic scapes uh, you can chop them up a, a lot of times i will chop up the part that's soft you don't want to wait too long. They get tough after a little while. You want to you want to try to pick them soon after they come up. Uh, but chop it up, and I'll saute it, and it's really good, like in mashed potatoes. It, it's just it tastes garlicky or kind of oniony in the case of these elephant garlic scapes. But I was surprised to see these. I guess I wasn't expecting them so early, but I think I'm actually just in denial about how late it is. We're halfway through May. Cold weather, folks. Rolls your eyes, but. <laughs> Here in central Arkansas, that's actually well into the season. <laughs> so all my other garlic, it's still pretty immature. It'll probably take a couple more months. But because I did plant the elephant garlic sooner, it's getting fairly close. Let's see what we got going on under here. Oh goodness, this one. Yeah, this one's already starting to split apart. Oh golly. Okay, so this was probably planted a little too deep. I need to harvest these because I don't want this to happen with the rest of them this is nuts bear what do you say well okay here we go that's nuts dang let's go step into the high tunnel out of the wind and talk about this monster. <laughs> this is not exactly the desirable <laughs> outcome of planting elephant garlic. Okay, so this has gone a little too far. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and harvest the rest of those here just in the next, I, I, I would like to let it dry out just a little bit because it's, it's just kind of muddy there. So I think maybe a day or so waiting would just make that a, a little cleaner job. I'll show you here what's happened get these roots right, so the way elephant garlic grows is it, it does like a head like a garlic bulb and then it gets these little things underneath it that look like little bulbs and they're called corms and you can use those also um, a lot of times what will happen is that when you pull it those corms will get left in the ground and they'll sprout and so a lot of times when you plant elephant garlic you'll end up having it there like for a long time when you harvest a head of garlic or an onion or anything like that if you want to store it you have to cure it which is to lay it out in a place where it can dry because all these layers which will be papery after it dries now they're like wet and they're kind of meaty but you can use this stuff immediately like if you decide you want to go ahead and use it you can pull it and use it you just gotta pull these away so i'm pulling this back just to see and here are some different cloves Oh goodness, here are some different cloves that are in this. Down here on the bottom, these are the corms. Now they would normally be really small, but these are actually pretty good size. I mean, that's a very small clove for elephant garlic, but it's about the size of a normal garlic clove. But let's see here. All right, so here are the actual cloves. So that is an elephant garlic clove. And this head of garlic See, part of these have already started to sprout. This is just in too long. I need to harvest them. They're not all this big. I went ahead and grabbed the biggest one that was out there. I just wasn't expecting this. A lot of times, once they get to the point that they're starting to put off their scapes and try to go to seed, it's time. A lot of times they're big enough at that point. Not always, but often. So yeah, this is what this looks like. Obviously this is filthy. Once the greenage the foliage of your garlic is starting to get brown on the tips and kind of like flop over a little bit usually that's the sign that it's pretty well done like if it's not staying real green and upright um, at that point your cloves are going to start separating they're not going to be as tight and that layers around it which turns into that papery wrapper it's going to start coming apart which is what happened here so this is actually still usable it's just a mess and I'm gonna take it inside and try to clean it up, but I do need to harvest the rest of that because I don't want them to all look like this. Oh golly. 
I need to wash my hands. We've, it's about to start raining again. The, I can feel it. You can probably hear it too. You can probably hear the wind picking up. So we've gotten over seven inches of rain this week. It's a lot. Everything is like very, very, very saturated and obviously the garden is growing a lot. Very, very grateful for that. I love, you know, the fact that we get so much rain. It definitely makes garden, gr gardening a lot easier, at least more hands off. It's getting to the point that areas are starting to flood, which is not great. We are not flooding so much. We live at a pretty high elevation. Our ground definitely gets very soggy and that's actually what that new load of gravel is for is we're gonna uh, finish out some areas making sure they drain well. But some places here, like water starting to come in people's houses. I showed you guys my black hollyhocks in my last vlog. So we're just, just so you're prepared for this, we're gonna be looking at these every time <laughs> until they're gone because I'm just <laughs> stunned by them. These may be some of my most favorite flowers I've ever grown. They're just absolutely amazing. Ugh, there comes the rain. It's starting to sprinkle. Bummer. I need some garden time. All right, Hi. back inside and guess what today is? It's Asher's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Asher. Thank you. How old are you? 14. So you asked me to make some pretzels for your birthday. So ja Jackson, are you gonna help me make Asher some birthday pretzels? Yep. Mm -hmm. Kitten's cute. All right. Yeah, the kitten is cute. You wanna come say, show him, say, there's William. There's William. Oh. Hey, look, we can't kill Jamie. Jamie's downstairs sitting on, a green, sitting on the green chair. Jamie's downstairs sitting on the chair. Asher, I love you. Love you too. Well guys, I think we are going to jump into our birthday celebrations. We've been spending the day uh, celebrating Asher. Michaela came in this morning and hung a, a banner up and Asher has, he has planned a special surprise lunch. Asher's job is to make lunch for the other kids. So Asher cooks lunch every day and that's uh, part of his job and part of his, like he gets his allowance and stuff for doing that job. And he has to actually make the meal plan and get it approved by me. And then he makes lunch every day by a certain time. He wanted to make a special birthday lunch of peanut butter and marshmallow cream sandwiches with gummy worms inside. Obviously not the normal meal plan, but I approved it because it was very sweet that he wanted to make something like really fun and special for his birthday lunch for his brothers. Um, and Jax and I are gonna make pretzels for our snack this afternoon. But uh, <laughs> whenever Michaela was looking at the meal plan, he's kept the secret from his brothers, but he told her, and she was like, I cannot believe your mom approved that. <laughs> she wasn't thinking about the fact that it was his birthday. And then he told her, she was like, oh, okay, I can understand that. So he's like walking around really secretive, excited for his special birthday lunch. And uh, we're about to get the good dough started for pretzels. If you want a little Roots and Refuge flashback, I'll find it. I'll try to find it, put a link down below. Jackson and I did a video. It's been a few years ago where we made our soft pretzels, the recipe that we use. Uh, and it is definitely when my babies were much smaller it's before we remodeled our kitchen and it's a pretty cool little throwback. So thank you guys for hanging out with us on this homestead morning. I bless you until next time.